There's an unusual words to put together usually, right? Marketing and science. Marketing people don't like it. They see their wonderful creative discipline has nothing to do with that boring mathematical science. And of course, most of us think, why would we put a noble word like science next to that horrible, crass marketing <laughs> word? Uh, but uh, they do actually have a long connection. And in fact, without marketing, there would be no science. For most of human existence, there was very little marketing. Of course, there was no science. And then about 10,000 years ago or so, some of our ancestors moved from hunting and gathering to farming, which was a, a, a bold step. It was a, it, was a, it was a difficult step. I mean, nutrition levels went down. Average height actually went down. It's quite hard. You wonder why they did it. Apparently, beer and wine had something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what they did is it started to create a specialization like it had never occurred before. You now had people who were farming, you had people who had to like guard the crops, so you had like soldiers, you had people who had to count the crops, accountancy was invented. Uh, and, and this led to more and more specialization and of course it led to more and more trade. I mean really trade kicked off once we started farming. And, and so marketing, the buying and selling of things goes hand in hand with specialization. It gives us wonderful returns, we're far more productive if we can trade and specialize. And so trade and specialization go together. And of course, it was that that led to eventually some people being so specialized that you could have people who could found the Royal Institute and some wealthy people could start doing science. Yeah. So without that, we'd all be still, well, grubbing for things in the forest. Uh, so, so, the, so we've had a marketing revolution, which is still going, and that led to, uh, very recently, a scientific revolution. It's an amazing discovery from human beings to discover science. It's very, very new, and it's transformed every single discipline it's touched. I mean, uh, as P.J. Rourke says, if you, if you ever, just one word will remind anyone who thinks that former generations might have been better than today. No, today is better. Just think dentistry. <laughs> So science has transformed our world. Uh, how does it work? Well, w all it is, is is doing repeated empirical observations, repeated observations of the real world, and looking for some sort of patterns, which we call scientific laws, things that hold under known conditions, hopefully a wide range of conditions, and hopefully with some known boundary conditions. And that, of course, means they keep repeating. That means we can make predictions. And in turn, we can make explanations about how the world works by knowing what affects them and what doesn't. And we can weave these together into a into a theory which is just nothing more than a fancy word that means a story that weaves some scientific laws together. So that's how science works and it's been radically changing our worldview. I mean science is not common sense. I mean common sense is that the sun moves through the sky and then we maybe elaborate and add that it's pulled by a god on a chariot or something like that but it's all wrong. <laughs> yeah. I mean science tells us weird things like that we're standing on a huge globe that spins rapidly in space, turning a full revolution every 24 hours. Weird stuff, huh? <laughs> Science is always weird. Uh, and, and it's been doing the same thing in marketing. But I just want to point out that before that, in medieval times, before the discovery of science, there were plenty of academics, there were big universities, uh, doctors would study for about 12 years, uh, but they would study theories that had been developed by people sitting in armchairs and having a think or gathering together and drinking wine at a symposium. Right? This is the way we invented things. And so we theorized with a complete absence of empirically grounded laws. And history has taught us that, that theories that have developed without laws tend to be incredibly fanciful and virtually always wrong. And sometimes really deadly. For example, um, in ancient Greece, which was the pinnacle of civilization at the time, uh, Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, and, and medicine really kicked off here with a theory known as humorial imbalance theory, which was matching. The, the Greeks loved beauty and symmetry. This is how they thought knowledge was gathered. So Plato had this idea of four elements. So Hippocrates said, well, that must be matched in the human body by four humors. Of course. <laughs> and medicine, of course, would be uh, well, fixing a humorial imbalance. When some of the humors were out of balance, you doctors would intervene and they'd do stuff like, well, bleeding was really popular and a whole lot of other nasty things. And for about 2,000 years, the net contribution of the medical community was to shorten our lives. <laughs> I mean, serious, it was. Until uh, very recently when science changed this and we moved away from theories that were just invented by people in ivory towers and we instead developed theory that were bound on empirically grounded laws. Now, the interesting thing for me as a marketing scientist is that marketing theory, which was largely developed in the last century, is incredibly medieval still. 
And marketing managers act like medieval doctors. They work on their experience and their intuition and, of course, common sense. Uh, you know, actually it was common sense that we should bleed people. Uh, so I'm going to just show you a little bit of something that marketing people believe quite passionately. It has underpinned marketing theory for a long time. Uh, and this is, a, this is the idea of uh, loyalty. Now, loyalty, of course, is a human, uh, is a natural you know, word that we use in everyday social language, I mean, like loyalty to spouse or the queen or, or whatever. And, and marketing took this in a very classic you know, medieval thing. We'll just, we'll just reason by analogy. We'll say, well, it, when people buy brands, they could also have loyalty. Uh, they must. Well, how well, does the, how well does the analogy go? Let, let's just put it to a little empirical test. Oh, the marketing behavior doesn't translate too well into the social <laughs> world. Uh, let's, try, let's try taking uh, the way we might behave in the social world and applying that to our brand choices. <laughs> It doesn't fit very well, does it? And yet marketers believe it. It's even just at face validity it doesn't work, and yet marketers believe this. They believe it to such extent that they'll invent all sorts of um, uh, elaborate theories on top to strive for deep relationships with our buyers, to build deep, passionate, emotional loyalty to our brand. Here's a little video. Find out why people join cults oh. and apply that knowledge to brands. I'm loyal to this practice. Right, we'll, we'll go back. Let, let's start. It's important to hear those first words. Find out why people join cults and apply that knowledge to brands. I'm loyal to this practice because it's done so much for me. If Atkin could find what pushed a person from mere fan to devoted disciple, perhaps he could market that knowledge. Most of the people I, I discuss the WWF with know that it's not a sport. Right. It's, a, it's a masculine ballet. So he compared dozens of groups he considered cults with so-called cult brands, from Harry Krishna to Harley Davidson. If you're smart and kind of individual, that's what you drive. Mm -hmm. From Falun Gong to Mac. I think, I think there's something about Mac users, like they get it. We just had discovered something. They realize there are other people like them and they cooperate on certain projects mm -hmm. and it's part of belonging to the tribe. And the conclusion was this, is that people, whether they're joining a cult or joining a brand, do so for exactly the same reasons. They need to belong and they want to make meaning. We need to figure out what the world is all about and we need the company of others. It's simply that. Saturn is a really good example. It's a mass cult brand. For example, 45,000 people turned up to spend their holiday, their vacation time at the factory in Tennessee instead of going to Disney World or the Grand Canyon. Now why would they do that? It's because they wanted to meet other people who own Saturns. They wanted to meet the rest of the Saturn family. They wanted to meet the people who made the car. The people who made the car wanted to meet them. And the people who ran uh, the Saturn business knew that. Uh, so the, uh, the reason we buy brands is exactly the same reason that we join cults. This is really pushing the theory further. But you know, there's a lot of competition to push theories further and further. Uh, it sounds sort of intuitively attractive. It sounds like perhaps common sense. But it's uh, rubbish. <laughs> and where was that wonderful loyalty for Saturn? Uh, actually, I've been to Tennessee recently. I can tell you why 40,000 people will turn up at a car factory opens in Tennessee on the weekend, because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> um, fortunately, there are some scientific laws about uh, buying behavior, and they tell us a lot about loyalty. Like there's this one, which is now we've observed for 50 years now, which is known as the double jeopardy law. It says that smaller brands have far fewer customers, and those customers are slightly less loyal. This shows up in behaviors and attitudes, and it's very systematic, everything from soap to soap operas. Uh, now, that might not sound that exciting. You know, of course, bigger brands would have more customers, but it didn't have to be that way. If we take a purely hypothetical uh, case, imagine two brands of equal market share, in this case, 14% share. That first brand in this time period that 14% share was made up of 32% of the market buying three times. Okay, now I'm going to look at another hypothetical 14% share brand. Uh, this one, right, same amount of sales, but it only has half the amount of customers. So of course the customers must buy twice as often, be twice as loyal for it to deliver the same amount of sales. Yep, those numbers, they all add up, perfect, great, great. That works perfectly in theory, 
but never in the real world. The real world is never like this. This would this this, not, this countervenes the double jeopardy law. Double jeopardy law says that brands don't vary, they vary a lot in penetration, but if they the loyalty metrics will be therefore uh, very very similar. We see this and here's some data on uh, gasoline retail sales. Big differences in the brand shares. I've ranked them from high to low, which shows up in huge differences in the size of their customer bases. And then it also shows in small differences in loyalty metrics, like how often those buyers buy that brand, like uh, what, how much of their total purchasing of the category they give, which is about a third to each brand, or how many 100% loyals the, the brand has in its customer base, people who only bought that brand. Very, very small figures there. But again, it's showing the very systematic effect of slightly higher for the bigger brands. So that's the law-like relationship that we would expect. But that's not what marketers believe. They believe that there can be small brands with highly loyal customer bases, where, where people have fallen in love with a brand, and they always cite these two examples, which shows a wonderful lack of imagination. They always show the same too, when there are hundreds of thousands of brands out there. Well, let's have a look at some data on these two then, the poster children for passionate brand loyalty. Um, it's Harley-Davidson. Harley-Davidson buyers buy Harley-Davidson about a third of the time. They buy other bikes twice as often as they buy Harley-Davidson, which is a very normal statistic. In fact, it's exactly the same statistic we just saw for retail fuel. Uh, what about Apple's repeat buying rate? So this is when you, you own a computer, what, say you buy a, an Apple or a Dell or whatever. When you go to buy another one, do you stay with the same brand? What proportion? There's Dell there on 71% repeat rate. Right? Very good loyalty. There's Apple, uh, HP, Compaq, and Gateway. And you can see there's nothing unusual. This is the double jeopardy pattern. Apple scoring normal. Maybe for its size, slightly higher. But then remember, if you switch from an Apple, you have to swap all your software. You switch from a uh, gateway to HP, you don't. And that's enough to explain its small loyalty advantage without any reference to passionate advocates and tribe members. Uh, here's an analysis of uh, Harley Davidson's owners. And uh, the segmentation came up with the biggest segment in their buyer base was this group. These were people who agreed most with statements like, most of the time my bike is just parked, I like wearing a helmet, I don't know other people who ride motorbikes. <laughs> uh, it sounds like uh, an average light uh, motorbike rider, not a passionate Harley fan, does it? Uh, this group looks more like the passionate Harley fan or who we would think of as driving into Harley. They're most likely to agree with, I like tattoos, beer, and I don't read books. <laughs> They're least likely to have bought the bike new. Probably most likely to have stolen the bike, actually. <laughs> but notice that's a very small segment and they're only of 10% and they're only 3.5% of sales revenue because they don't spend very much money. So they might be the true loyals, but they're not very important. In fact, uh, if we actually develop a loyalty metric, uh, which the researchers did, which they called Harley Zeal, people who said things like, I would never, I hate Japanese bikes and things like that. Uh, those people tend to be worth least to the company, and there's also hardly any of them. So it's not a story of passionate loyalty. The reality is we are loyal. Right? We go into a supermarket and we can get out of the supermarket in like 10 minutes, even though there's 45,000 items looking at us. And we do it because we show amazing loyalties to just seeing the brands that we buy. But it's not super passionate and it's not ultra committed. We're polygamous in our loyalty. <laughs> We don't buy all brands, but we shuffle between the brands that we buy yeah, uh, with predictable patterns. So marketing, therefore, is not about building uh, super passionate buyers or convincing them that you are the only brand for them and all the others are rubbish. It's largely a battle to make it easy for, you, for some customers to buy you and to repeat buy you. And that's a battle for mental and physical availability, which those two things together make things easy to buy. So it is a constant ongoing battle for attention, not love. And uh, I'll leave a final word for the bright future for marketing. This comes from Joe Tripodi, the Chief Marketing Officer of Coca-Cola. Science has transformed every discipline it's touched. Hopefully it's now marketing's turn. Thank you.